Good afternoon. I'm Mike Osterholm. I direct the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. And it's my pleasure today to actually uh, moderate this session uh, that we have to dealing with the U.S. agency approaches to cervid carcass disposal in the context of chronic waste and disease. Um, we're extremely honored to have with us today uh, two very distinguished speakers, uh, one who has recently finished his PhD on this very topic, and one who is one of the senior uh, wildlife management uh, experts in the country, uh, and I'll introduce both of them. Well, let me start out by saying uh, we want to thank you for being here. The response to this uh, particular uh, podcast has really been quite remarkable in demonstrating just how important this topic really is. You'll have a webinar format here where you'll have a presentation by both individuals uh, followed by questions and answers. Put the questions, please, in the QA box throughout the presentation. Uh, and then we will take those at the end of the so last 20 minutes of the session and ask those questions. Attendees won't be able to unmute or use the chat, only ask questions in the Q&A box. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and it'll be added to SIDRAP's uh, YouTube channel. So you can go back and look at this again or share it with colleagues at their convenience. Uh, as I noted, today's speakers will be discussing the U.S. agency approaches to cervid carcass disposal to chronic waste and disease management. Uh, at this point, I think all of us recognize the growing challenges that this particular disease poses uh, from a wildlife perspective and even a potential public health perspective. Uh, let me introduce our, our two speakers. The first one today is Dr. Corey Anderson. He's co-director of the CIDRAP Chronic Waste and Disease Program, which focuses on chronic waste and disease spread among cervids and the potential transmission to humans and other animal species. Corey joined CIDRAP in 2019 and helped launch the CWD program that, that same year. Corey uh, did his PhD thesis on characterizing the U.S. agency approaches to cervid carcass disposal in the context of CWD management, so we could not have a more expert and timely speaker than Corey in this regard. Uh, Corey earned his PhD and his MPH in environmental health sciences at the University of Minnesota. The second speaker really needs no introduction to most people on this screen. Uh, Dr. Russ Mason is the executive and resident at Michigan Department of Natural Resources and adjunct professor at Michigan State University's College of Agricultural and Natural Resources. Uh, I must add in context, and was also a very critical advisor on Corey's PhD thesis and played a huge role in helping to focus that, that particular thesis. Russ has had an incredibly uh, distinguished and long career in wildlife management starting back in 1986 as the supervisor of the National Wildlife Laboratory at the University of Pittsburgh, or Pennsylvania and the Monell Chemical Census Center. After that, he served as director of the USDA Predation Ecology Field Station at Utah State University. And in 2001, he became the Mammals Program Manager for the USDA's National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. In 2004, he became science advisor to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies in Washington, D.C. And in 2005, he was named wildlife chief for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And in 2008, the chief of Michigan's DNA, or DNR Wildlife Division. Uh, I must say it has been an honor working with uh, uh, Russ. I felt like most days I have conversations with him, I ought to be paying tuition fees for what I learned. So thank you so much for being with us, Russ. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Corey. Uh, for his presentation. And then right after that, uh, we'll hear from Russ, and then we'll go to questions and answers. So again, thank you for being with us. Remind you that put your questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring those and go from there. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Mike, uh, for the kind words, the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, as Mike mentioned, the level of interest in this is impressive, to say the least. Um, and also just, I'd be remiss to, to not thank Mike and Russ, as Mike alluded to, uh, they were both critical in, in helping me out with this. Uh, this was the work that I did for my PhD thesis or dissertation. Um, and they were, again, couldn't have done it without them. So uh, a lot of what I will share with you today, uh, again, it's going to be sort of a 30,000 foot view, uh, just scratching the surface. Um, of this topic, and of course, you know if you if you want more information or if you are interested uh, in far more detail, uh, the dissertation is publicly available. Um, I believe it's uploaded on ProQuest. Otherwise, I've listed my email here as well. You can always uh, reach out, and I will make sure you have a copy of that. 
Um, like I said, I'll just be basically skimming the surface, um, but hopefully it will be of interest to those who have joined. So again, just with the level of participation that we have in this, uh, I've seen, I know a lot of you are probably familiar with chronic wasting disease and prion. So if, if you are, this is maybe a little, uh, this is old news to you, but for those who are maybe less familiar, um, just wanted to introduce our main characters in this story uh, that we're talking about with chronic wasting disease. Um, and it's important to understand from an infectious disease standpoint that uh, chronic wasting disease is unique and that it's caused by a prion. Um, and I know obviously a lot of us are familiar with infectious diseases as of late uh, with COVID, um, but as you know, COVID is a virus um, and prions are quite a bit different than viruses um, or your typical bacteria. And so basically to try to sum it up, and I'll keep this sort of broad, but um, it's important to understand that there are normal prion proteins um, that are expressed on the surface of cells. A lot of different animals have them, including all of us on this call, uh, express these normal prion proteins. It's formed by a single gene. Um, and in its normal uh, form, it's highly soluble. Uh, it usually only lasts a few hours before it's degraded uh, after being expressed. And it's one of those ongoing mysteries in that we don't really understand its exact function um, as of right now. And to be honest, I don't know if we would even really care if it weren't for prion diseases. And what happens is essentially these uh, disease-causing prions are introduced into an animal or a human. Um, and this can be introduced in sort of three different ways. Uh, this can happen either sporadically or kind of spontaneously. Uh, there are genetic prion diseases. And then, of course, there are infectious prion diseases as well. And what these disease-causing prions are, are really just a misfolded form of that normal prion protein I mentioned in the last slide. Um, and when they become misfolded or introduced, um, they can act as a template for disease. So basically, they can interact directly with the normal uh, prion proteins. And again, we don't necessarily understand the exact mechanism, but they can lead to those normal prion proteins that can cause them to misfold uh, as well. And it's sort of this ongoing, long process um, where prions are slowly accumulating in the infected host. Um, and that sort of gives rise to uh, one characteristic of prion disease um, in that they they have fairly long incubation periods. So basically the time between when you're exposed and when you actually show clinical signs of disease uh, can range from, you know, six months to years to even decades uh, with these prion diseases. Uh, another feature of prions that is fairly well known um, is that these infectious prions, this misfolded form, uh, unlike the normal form, where they're easily digested, these become highly resistant uh, in their misfolded state. And they can actually withstand a lot of the treatments and disinfectants that work to um, inactivate bacteria or viruses. Uh, these prions can often withstand that. And you can see there, it's not something we can necessarily cook out of meat uh, and that you know it can basically retain its infectivity up to 600, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in some studies. And so again, that was a very brief overview. I'll do the same with CWD. And if, if you have questions, like I said, feel free to reach out. But uh, just a general overview of CWD. Um, this is really a prion disease that is uh, affecting cervids. So those are uh, deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Um, as I mentioned, with that extended incubation period uh, with CWD, it generally is 18 to 24 months between when an animal you know, is exposed and actually becomes infected. And for that time, it does not show any, you know, clinical symptoms of the disease for that incubation period. Uh, it appears totally healthy uh, and it behaves fairly normally. Um, what makes CWD a challenge in managing is that for a majority of that incubation period, um, they actually can shed these CWD prions in a variety of bodily fluids. Um, Prions have been detected in saliva, urine, feces, blood, antler velvet, semen, all of infected um, cervids. And if they do happen to make it to the end of that incubation period, uh, there is a short window where they do show clinical uh, symptoms. Uh, one pretty key piece is the wasting element, so a pretty dramatic weight loss. Um, they basically start losing coordination uh, and their behavior becomes, you know, very abnormal in that sense. And just some other key points of CWD in general, as of right now, we don't have a vaccine or an effective therapeutic um, when it comes to CWD. 
you might hear talk of genetics um, and that can play some role, but I just think it's important to point out that there is no complete genetic resistance that's known to uh, prevent CWD infection. Uh, there is some genetic component to uh, reduce susceptibility, but I won't get into that. Uh, and then there is no current evidence that CWD has infected humans, but again, work we're doing with SIDRAP, I think there's you know quite a bit of exposure and it's that the answer has not been fully or that question has not been fully answered at this point. Um, just to give a general sense of where we're at with CWD in North America, if you would have looked at this map a month ago, it would have been at 31 states. Um, but just a week or two ago, uh, they actually detected the first case of CWD uh, in Kentucky. So we're up to 32 states with detections in either uh, wild or captive deer or cervids and uh, four Canadian provinces. And it's not just limited to North America. It has um, been detected in other countries as well. Uh, you can see here the different countries it's been detected in. The year it was first detected, uh, it was shipped to South Korea um, in captive elk. Uh, and then more recently, Scandinavia has uh, had an ongoing issue, particularly in Norway, uh, regarding CWD outbreak there. So in sort of transitioning to where we're at or where the work I did for my dissertation, I just want to point out some of the known risks for CWD transmission. And there's a lot that we don't know about prions and CWD um, in general, um, but there are things we do know. And I think it's just important to lay out known risks. So of course, one is any movement of live cervids. And given that, you know, if you're an infected cervid, you're obviously, you're appearing healthy, uh, you're walking around, natural movement can certainly play a role um, in spreading disease in sort of a localized area. However, I think everyone on the wildlife side of things would tell you that, you know, I think the human assisted movement has played a far greater role in terms of spreading this disease. Um, and that's where essentially between captive servant industry and wildlife managers were basically locating or moving these animals uh, fairly long distances. Um, and because they appear totally healthy, they could be uh, infected. We don't have a great live test uh, for CWD. Um, we can sort of lead to different outbreaks in that uh, through that method. Another risk, however, though, and again, this is key for this talk, is just this whole idea of moving carcasses and improper carcass disposal. So I mentioned uh, again early on that these prions are highly resistant. They can retain their infectivity even in the environment for prolonged periods of time. Um, as far as CWD goes, there's peer reviewed data that shows, you know, at least two and a half years where they can, um, the environment can basically remain infectious, uh, when it's been contaminated with CWD prions. And it sounds like there actually could be some work showing that it could be up to 15 years as well. Um, so basically once these prions are in the environment, um, they're there for quite a while, which makes this whole idea of, you know, an infected animal even when it's no longer alive, when it's, you know, reduced to a carcass, uh, can still pose a risk to other susceptible cervids um, that are possibly exposed to them. And so I think, you know, if you go through, you could see that hunters, which play a key role in cervid population management and CWD management, um, are obviously receiving a lot of messages on um, what to do with carcasses, how to properly dispose of them. But as we know, taxidermists and processors uh, could play a role in this as well. Um, this is just a map. I, it's it's getting a little more outdated, um, but I do think it's worth showing. This was put together by USGS, um, and what they did is basically looked at these four counties in Wisconsin, southwest Wisconsin, and the core CWD area where prevalence of the disease uh, is up to 50% uh, in adult bucks uh, in very localized areas. And what they did is basically mapped the home zip codes of hunters that traveled to one of these four counties in Wisconsin and actually successfully harvested a deer uh, in those counties. And this was in a single year. And you can see that, I mean, even in the bottom left, it shows that Alaska and Hawaii um, were featured. So basically people from almost every state in the U.S. in a single year had traveled to one of these four counties in Wisconsin where CWD prevalence is, you know, 30, 40 or 50 percent and actually harvested an animal. I think Obviously, you get into what was the the fate of that carcass. Did they actually take it back out of Wisconsin and move it to, you know, their home state? Again, that's where we don't have great data on that. They're not technically supposed to. But I think it just goes to show you the uh, 
the breadth of this issue and just how extensive um, this could be and why it is a concern as far as carcass disposal and management goes. And I bring that up because actually just recently there were headlines generated. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was in South Carolina uh, where hunters actually were cited because they brought back uh, an infected deer from Kansas. South Carolina has not detected CWD in a, a wild or a captive cervid at this point, um, but it's been detected in states adjacent to them. And so um, it just goes to show you this deer did end up testing positive um, and their wildlife agency has been it's been dealing with that. And so again, I've sort of mentioned this already or alluded to it, but uh, just to recap the risks that are posed by cervid remains. Again, any infected service carcass parts left on the landscape could be a reservoir for transmission if they're left accessible to other animals. You can see the pictures on the left here. It shows that, you know, animals are pretty curious, even deer. Um, so when these mortality sites are available, uh, they are frequently visited, not just by scavengers, but potentially other servants as well. Uh, another concerning piece of the whole carcass disposal conversation is that uh, a lot of the highest risk parts, so that's your spinal column or potentially your skull with brain material, um, are often the ones that remain after processing. Um, obviously, not many people would be um, consuming that or using that. And so those would be probably more of the parts that would be disposed of or or um, tossed out. And of course, as I sort of mentioned, um, depending on where they're thrown away, if they are thrown away, uh, what is done with it, this could lead to new disease foci. And I mean, as, part, as far as the, the role of wildlife agencies, I'll get into this in just a bit, but basically this has sort of been the inspiration for wildlife agencies to implement uh, disposal plans or these carcass importation restrictions, just because this is sort of known to be an understood risk. Let's see. So uh, in 2018, I believe it was published uh, by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. It was an extremely comprehensive document, and basically it was there technical report on best management practices for preventing uh, CWD. And in that document, if you look, uh, there's actually an entire chapter dedicated to carcass disposal. Uh, and they do a great job of basically laying out these best management practices for reducing the risk. And you can see the options they list there, uh, one being incineration, two being chemical digestion. Um, they mentioned composting. Um, that fourth bullet point, it's essentially dumpsters or temporary sites. And then fifth, they list this approved landfill. So um, there are certainly options that exist for carcass disposal that are deemed best practices by AFWA. Um, and just to note landfills, which I think play a critical role in carcass disposal, or at least a, a pretty key element of this whole discussion, um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is actually approved of certified line landfills as a means to help control CWD. Um, but I think it's also important to point out that if you look at the AFWA best management practices, even with these other disposal options that are deemed um, best practices, so your incineration, chemical digestion, um, they actually recommend that the byproducts of those options are still disposed of in a landfill. So I guess the whole key point is to say that at the end of the day, a lot of these uh, products, whether it's the carcass itself or the byproducts, are recommended to sort of end up in a in a landfill. Um, and you can see that you know just the appeal of landfills in general, with its scalability and uh, its cost effectiveness, make it uh, a pretty attractive option for this. At the same time, uh, there have been a lot of problems and challenges that have plagued um, this issue, which is basically why I did my project on it. Um, but you can see that essentially for a variety of reasons we won't get into necessarily unless it comes up in Q&A, uh, there have been a growing number of challenges on just growing reluctance among landfill operators uh, and their willingness to accept serving carcasses as waste. And so again, just pointing to that technical report, they, they say it flat out where as many landfills begin to close or discontinue accepting, options for disposal may become limited. And they sort of point to the consequences of that. And I'll run through these quick, but it just gives you a sense of scale. Um, this was a report out of Wyoming, and they basically mentioned it's from 2019, but they mentioned that, you know, 30 to 40 tons a year of wild game carcasses were thrown away at this certain location, but it's no longer available to them. Um, and they won't accept potentially infected animals in another place. 
Same thing in Minnesota. This has been a, a challenge the past several years. Um, there is one instance of basically a landfill taking it um, and also incinerating. And it just got to be, again, I think they summed it up well at the bottom of this article where they say they're discovering there's no perfect affordable way to dispose of carcasses. And again, uh, there was another instance in Minnesota where it's not just the landfill itself. It's obviously part of an entire system. And there was an example in Minnesota, at least at one point, of a landfill being willing to take carcasses, but because they transported leachate to a wastewater treatment plant, um, the wastewater treatment plant basically told them that they wouldn't accept the leachate if they accepted carcasses. So it's all part of this very complicated uh, dynamic system. So essentially, prior to this project, um, while all these issues were arising, even here in Minnesota, uh, the challenging part was that there was really no comprehensive assessment of uh, what state agencies were doing in, re in regards uh, with cur cervic carcass disposal. And so that's where my uh, research or my goals, um, my study sort of came to fruition. And I had three objectives with this study. Uh, first was to characterize the U.S. State Wildlife Agency plans, uh, practices and perspectives. And then from there, I obviously, again, understood it's not just limited to wildlife agencies. There are a number of different state agencies involved with this issue. Um, so after I got the wildlife agency perspective, I wanted to reach out or branch out uh, and get additional perspectives from other state level agencies. Um, and then from that, just sum up um, what was being done, what challenges were being faced, and what might help. And so I'll run through the methods uh, pretty quick and then get to results. And as I mentioned, it's not going to be all of the results by any means. So if you want a more comprehensive uh, look at this, uh, feel free to, to read the document because this is just a, a small amount of the information. So there are really kind of two phases to this whole effort. The first, as I mentioned, was the, the U.S. Uh, wildlife agency approach. And so that essentially looked like sending out a questionnaire to um, these agencies. And after I got results from that, uh, I moved to phase two, which was uh, involved interviews with state agency personnel. Again, not limited to wildlife agencies, but other agencies also. Um, so when we get to phase one, um, we distributed this survey to all 50 state wildlife agencies. We did not limit it based on CWD presence or absence, um, just because our goal is to essentially understand for states without CWD detections, what might be helpful. Are they thinking about this issue? Um, and then of course, for states with CWD, we wanted to know what they were doing. Um, and I was fortunate, again, this is where Russ uh, was a godsend in many ways. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get responses from all 50 states um, in about a three-month span. And so this provides a national perspective of what states are doing on this issue. And I, again, I won't go through uh, the results for all of these, but you can see sort of the, the information that was addressed or sort of sought after in these questionnaires. So we wanted to understand the regulatory authority of the wildlife agencies, uh, whether they actually had written plans and what were featured, if disposal was part of that plan, um, what methods they actually utilized for disposal, whether they uh, deployed dumpsters as a tool, and then again, what would be helpful for them uh, and developing or refining plans, and then any challenges or obstacles they faced. Uh, and just to get to the study methods for phase two before results, uh, again, this was a follow-up to the survey and really involved reaching out to personnel from these different agencies uh, in select number of states. So you can see uh, we basically tried to reach any agency that might have involvement with cervic carcass disposal. So that span from your wildlife agency to your Department of Agriculture, um, environmental agencies, Department of Transportation, um, down the board. Um, and we ended up picking three separate states for this. Um, and as you can see, we had those discussions or interviews with those personnel uh, between December of 2022 and February 2023. And so to get into the results, uh, this, a lot of what I'll be showing you is uh, the survey results, just because the interview is, um, it's it's a lot of text. Um, but to get into the results, these, this is from the survey of state wildlife agencies. You can see from the get-go, we wanted to understand, you know, beyond wildlife, what 
uh, regulatory authority do you have in terms of uh, disposal related entities? Um, and it was pretty obvious from the start that a lot of state wildlife agencies had limited regulatory authority over many entities that would be involved with serving carcass disposals. You can see uh, solid waste in particular, your landfills. Um, not many wildlife agencies had, you know, direct regulatory authority to sort of implement rules um, or to to connect with those folks in that regard. Let's see. All right. And this was in response to uh, having written CWD plans. Uh, whether those plans address cervic carcass disposal. The good news in that regard was that the vast majority of states had a written CWD plan, and most, again, regardless of CWD status, uh, indicated that they had um, addressed cervic carcass disposal in either their policies or in their plan. When it came to the actual methods that were utilized by states um, that address disposal, you can see that the overwhelming majority uh, relied primarily on landfills. Um, 32 of 38 basically said that they use landfills. Um, more than half also indicated that they use an incin uh, incineration for cervic carcass disposal. And then from there, it starts to, to fall under that 50% mark uh, with, with fewer using on-site burial, um, the chemical digestion again being uh, more limited and then composting even, even further. And this is sort of branches off from that. I thought it was an interesting perspective that was laid out uh, by one respondent. And you can see the language they used in talking about, you know, their, their ongoing conversations with landfill companies and then being sympathetic to the need and importance of, of using landfills for disposal. But they also use the language of comparing, you know, servid carcass remnants to almost a toxic substance uh, and worries about future litigation um, basically hesitancy uh, caused by that. Another result that was apparent across the board was just that in general, no matter what disposal option you're talking about, accessibility was a significant challenge. Um, you can see some of the responses where, you know, the vast majority of a state might not have a landfill. Um, some states might not have chemical digestion or incineration. Um, and so it just gets into a lot of the logistical concerns and accessibility, um, especially in rural, rural states. Uh, in terms of dumpsters, uh, again, this is, I think, an initiative that's sort of gained steam in the past several years. I know Wisconsin was kind of early to the game in that regard, and Minnesota has followed suit. And there's, you can see a variety of states that have actually started implementing dumpster programs. Um, Based on my survey results, it looks like a quarter of U.S. states are now providing dumpsters. But I thought it was very interesting, again, when you start looking into the results or the, the actual responses from uh, these folks who are sort of involved in setting up these dumpster programs, they become very complicated very fast. Um, obviously, they're expensive to implement, but you can see just other logistical challenges that came up as barriers. And, you know, where do you actually site these dumpsters in a place that you know, draws a lot of carcasses and not waste that's not sought after. And then, of course, you're talking about places that might not have weather, uh, very conducive to leaving out dumpsters uh, filled with serving carcass parts. So uh, it's a lot to think through from a, a state wildlife agency standpoint. And then again, another very key finding, I think, that came up uh, in this, this survey was just we basically asked them um, what groups they had provided targeted disposal guidance to. Uh, the vast majority provided it to hunters. Uh, you can see most provided it to taxidermists. And then it sort of went down where less provided to meat processors or captive servant operators. Um, but basically, depending on who they provided this targeted guidance to, we followed up and basically asked the question, in your opinion, how well are each of these following groups actually complying with um, your disposal recommendations or rules? And you can see it's pretty apparent across the board that there's a lot of uncertainty regarding the uh, level of compliance with uh, these disposal initiatives, even if they are providing targeted information to these audiences. And so I think that's a big question mark um, that, that sort of stuck out when I was going through these results. Um, another common thread among responses was that more than half of state wildlife agencies uh, basically expressed that they had very limited oversight. 
and many were concerned about compliance when they were asked about challenges or obstacles. Um, some pitched it almost as, you know, maybe they need to improve educational campaigns or messaging, um, but others were sort of more concerned about actual apathy setting in among hunters who, even if they did in, uh, improve education or expand educational uh, campaigns, they were they were sort of worried that uh, there was just a, a general sense of apathy or disease fatigue among hunters. And um, they really just did not have a lot of opportunity or routes for oversight uh, with, um, you know, basically making sure or checking to see if their audience uh, is is listening or following the recommendations or rules. And like I said, I just limited the interview results to this one slide uh, because it's it's text heavy, but just some uh, common threads that came out uh, during the interviews with state agency personnel across the three different states, again, Colorado, um, Minnesota, and Pennsylvania. And it was pretty apparent in all three states, cross-agency collaboration was commonly talked about. I thought it was interesting, though, uh, um, the perception of how effective that cross-agency collaboration was varied quite a bit. Um, and just to give sort of two polar opposite examples, um, one state essentially mentioned that um, their work with their environmental agency was absolutely critical and getting participation from landfill operators. Um, they basically were working in tandem with their environmental agency um, to keep landfills available for disposal. In another state, they essentially said that they thought cross-agency collaboration was, was essentially a waste of time at that point because they weren't really seeing um, much tangible benefit in their mind from uh, these different state agencies. Um, there were also several interviewees uh, across different states that pointed out, I think this was, again, these interviews were happening at a time when high path avian influenza was uh, prominent. And so it was interesting that that was brought up several times uh, across these different states and agencies where basically, you know, with high path potentially having, uh, they would they would associate high path with the potential human risk and they would almost talk down the their concerns about CWD just given it's um, the lack of evidence showing its transmission to humans. Um, sort of on that related note, uh, I thought it was interesting that risk perception was often a critical determinant for uh, involvement, but it was often not rooted in scientific data. Uh, again, there was one example of a landfill that had basically had a history of prion disease. The operator um, in their family had known of prion diseases, and they were extremely proactive about um, disposing of potentially infected carcasses. On the other hand, there were landfills that um, were not interested at all. Uh, another pretty key point that was fairly evident, but obviously came through in these results was just that transportation departments, um, which I don't know if they're often thought about in this conversation, um, but they are actively involved in disposal. Uh, and even within states, uh, the procedures for disposing of carcasses could vary quite a lot. Uh, and then just across the board, and I think this is true with a lot of CWD conversations had, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty that exacerbates this issue. Um, just in understanding the best options for disposal, understanding the characteristics of prion, can they actually enter the leachate? If you have a clay liner, uh, does that you know prevent it from reaching the leachate? There's just a lot of very detailed risk-oriented questions that we don't have a ton of um, great data on. And so just to recap key findings, um, I think, you know, one, it was just important to lay out that state wildlife agencies, again, have a very vested interest in CWD uh, and CWD management. Um, but for the most part, they lack general authority when it comes to regulating a lot of the entities that might be involved with disposal related issues. So uh, again, they don't work on their own. They need cooperation from uh, groups like landfills if they're recommending them or meat processors. Uh, in many cases, they don't have you know direct oversight over those groups. Um, a good sort of silver lining to this was that uh, most state wildlife agencies actually had written CWD plans. Again, even if they haven't detected the disease, I believe it was 46 of 50 states said they had a written plan. 
uh, more than three quarters addressed carcass disposal. That said, there's always the flip side where, you know, the fact that there are still states without these plans, I think it just shows that there are lingering vulnerabilities in that regard. Um, and nearly every state agency that was involved with disposal uh, primarily um, relied on landfills. This wasn't necessarily shocking to me. I think it's very been very helpful to actually get a sense of, you know, the number or magnitude of that. Um, but I think the most concerning and most telling part in my mind uh, is that, you know, apart from landfills, uh, there were few, if any, alternative options that existed um, if landfills, you know, became less and less available, uh, which has been the trend in some states as of late. On the last page of key findings here as well, um, the development and application of targeted guidance for disposal uh, was typically limited uh, to just a few select entities. Again, hunters were very commonly provided this guidance. Taxidermists, uh, I think it was again more than half, but as far as you know, providing disposal guidance for processors or captive servant operators or even landfills, uh, it, was, it was far less common. And then again, I think one of the more telling points is just that this effort made it very apparent that a lot of state level agencies uh, involved in servant carcass disposal or providing guidance. At the end of the day, they had very limited insight as to what the levels of compliance were with their guidance or rules, um, which is a challenge. And so moving forward, just to cap things off here, I mean, I think if you are part of a wildlife agency or have worked on this issue, it's it's very obvious to you. But um, basically, a lot of time and resources are being invested into serving carcass disposal. And I think, the, again, the big challenge with that is that we still don't really know what the tangible benefit of those investments are. Um, so what's the actual reduction of CWD risk? How many people are following the guidance you're putting out? Again, I think it's it's a huge glaring question mark um, there. And so I guess from this, this effort, it became pretty apparent to me that uh, we'd benefit from putting together more comprehensive cost-benefit analyses on this topic. Of course, one of those um, informing that cost-benefit analysis, I think one major piece would be better assessing compliance among groups, um, just in whether they're, you know, listening to your guidance or following rules, it might not be a, you know, across the board, um, total understanding of what everyone's doing, but getting a better sense of that is important. And sort of in tandem with that is just this whole idea of, I think we really need to focus on, you know, overall survey mortality, or at least consider that. Um, and I think it's interesting when you look between hunting on an annual basis and animal vehicle collisions, uh, there's roughly 7.3 million cervid carcasses being generated, again, on an annual basis. And so I think at the end of the day, it's it's important to ask, or at least have in the back of our mind, the question of, you know, one, how many of these animals are actually infected with CWD or potentially infected? Again, it's kind of back to the envelope math or guessing, but I think it's important to consider. And then two is just what proportion of those infected animals are being properly disposed of, Um are they ending up on the landscape? Are they ending up in a landfill? Again, I think that will sort of inform um, our guidance and initiatives in this area moving forward. And then I think the the troubling part to me is just even with all this work, um, I think there's still this unknown lingering question of just how long will carcass disposal, as we know it right now, uh, how long will it remain viable uh, particularly sustainable moving forward, uh, even if, you know, CWD remains uh, in cervids, but, you know, you can sort of imagine other scenarios as well if there was spillover. Um, what's the future look like for disposal? And I think that's that's a question that many states are going to have to face and continue to face uh, moving forward. And so with that, I believe that is all I have. Again, thank you for attending. Hopefully this uh, helped answer some of your questions. And like I said, if you have any more, feel free to, to reach out my emails right there. Thanks, Corey, uh, for a very comprehensive overview. Next, we're going to turn to Russ. Uh, and uh, he has a couple of slides here for comments on this, and then we'll open it up. So uh, Russ, is, it's all yours. Thank you, Mike. I wrote this for myself just to make sure that I covered the points that I wanted to. First, I think... Uh, it's important to recognize that what Corey has here is the first comprehensive national investigation uh, of the potential problems associated with carcass disposal in the CWD. 
Very impressive. In fact, in my 40 years of, of work in this area, this is the first time all 50 states have responded to any query from anybody So that I know. Of. So it's a remarkable piece of work. Um, the topic of carcass uh, disposal is critically important to wildlife agencies in any case for a host of reasons. First and most important is, as Corey mentioned, it's the go-to option for agencies. Um, and there are fears in most agencies, the loss of uh, landfill access could accelerate the loss of hunters while simultaneously enhancing the spread of disease, both by local hunters and traveling hunters. It's important to, to sort of note that about 63% of all license sales in the United States for hunting are for deer hunting. And those licenses plus uh, accompanying federal excise tax are a major support of uh, most agencies in this country. So agencies have these concerns. Uh, they also were quite aware that there are an insufficient number of appropriately designed facilities in strategically important areas to safely accommodate carcass disposal. And because of that, they are somewhat reluctant to, to rock the boat. Many states, are, in my experience, are somewhat reluctant to actually bring up this topic unless somebody brings it up before them because they, they're getting by, but they're frightened by the possibilities. There are also municipal headaches for small towns, health departments, and of course, road and transportation departments. In many states, on a biannual or annual basis, transportation will come to the departments of natural resources and ask for funding to remove carcasses. Uh, typically, everyone points out that funds are provided by the Federal Department of Transportation to keep roadways clear. So what sometimes happens is the road departments, rather than taking them to a, a landfill, just push them off into somebody's front lawn or move it down the road and dump it in a farm field or on a, on a public uh, piece of property. At present, there are no realistic disposal alternatives to landfills for hunters, taxidermists, or most importantly, perhaps meat processors. Uh, although it's, it used to be the case that most hunters process their own deer, um, particularly in the Southeast and parts of the Midwest, uh, a super majority of deer actually go to processors. So hunters aren't actually doing their own work. And in the absence of those processes, it would be a direct impact on, on the number of hunters, which in turn affects the business model of a lot of uh, 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 natural resource agencies. Um, go to the next slide, please. Um, Corey brings up a wonderful point. Just because there are plans and just because those plans are promoted through, through media in various ways to the hunting population and others, uh, most agencies, I hazard to say all agencies, don't actually know how many carcasses are disposed of. There aren't any standards uh, or ways that we would look at this. It's important to recognize that while CWD is an interjurisdictional disease, Deer are managed by the states. There is no federal management of deer per se, uh, because deer are essentially not migratory. And so we have this patchwork across the country of what is or isn't done, uh, and a patchwork, frankly, in terms of how much we know about where carcasses are going. Um, in terms of landfilling, at least in the Midwest, a number of states are are concerned with with the possibility that that uh, Putting CWD in landfills, is, the risk is overblown. But I, I want to mention that that we don't really know that. It is, it's, uh, it's, it's more defense of the only economical alternative than it is that we know that there's a low likelihood of CWD spread with a, a high enough uh, number of carcasses in the landfill. Um, coupled with that, by the way, and Corey brought this up, it's important. Some of his uh, respondents talked about uh, uh, disease fatigue in, in the public as well as in the agencies um, because uh, they've been told for many years that at present there is no known human risk. Folks tend to de-emphasize the potential problems uh, with CWD. Um, in Wisconsin, for example, close to six out of 10 hunters that receive a positive CWD test. In other words, they've submitted their deer for testing, they get a test back and says, yeah, your deer has CWD. They go ahead and eat it anyway. So they're clearly not concerned and who knows what they're doing with the carcass uh, in the meantime. As well, I don't think that the agency personnel, certainly not hunters and others, understand that the zoonotic risk of CWD is a moving target. So 
CWD strains continue to prol proliferate. And so whereas CWD might not have been a, a, a as big of a, a problem in the past in terms of zoonotic threat, the chance exists that one of these strains sooner or later will become uh, more dangerous. We just don't know. We don't collect that data. In fact, the only state that's collecting strain data happens to be Wisconsin. And then finally, uh, and I want to reemphasize this point, 7.3 million carcasses, and we really don't know where any of them go, other than to say categorically a bunch go to landfills, some end up on the back 40, some get dumped out along the road or on public land someplace. So we, we don't know what's happening. We don't know how many of those carcasses are being disposed of appropriately. Potentially, uh, that's a huge problem. And it suggests that there are a number of pieces of fundamental data that we need to collect uh, one way or another so that we have a better handle on the, the risk posed by carcasses and also what's been done with them. Thank you very much, Russ, for that really wonderful overview of perspective. Um, we're going to open it up right now, but first let me just uh, ask a question uh, in terms of, of just general sense of where things are at. Given the diversity of challenges right now among the interviewed agencies you did, Corey, and rush your real life experience, would we benefit more from having more federal guidance to try to standardize this issue? Or is this an issue really left best individual states to deal with, given the differences in CWD prevalence and the agency relationships? How should this look going forward? It seems right now the fragmentation uh, is a challenge. Russ? Uh, I'm having a look. I've, I've got a problem uh, with the uh, audio. Okay. Uh, Corey, you, you heard that. Can you uh, take that? Yeah, I was hoping that Russ would would go first because I think <laughs> wisdom in this well, area would be. Can, wait, can, Corey, can you hear me? Yep, we can do it real fine. All right, well, then maybe we don't have a problem with the audio. Okay. I think it, it, it's an interesting question. As I mentioned, deer are a, a state jurisdictional species. States tend to be, uh, on a, and rightfully so, fairly protective of their authorities. At the same time, uh, because the disease is clearly interjurisdictional in nature, there, there's a case to be made for some sort of framework of standardization across the country so that data are collected in the same way, the same kinds of requirements are there and so forth. Um, I, I don't know how willing federal agencies are to step into that, and I'm quite certain that a number of state agencies would direct, uh, would be uh, very unhappy. At the same time, uh, something different needs to be done if, we get, if we're going to get control of the spread of this disease. And whether or not certain uh, methods are effective or not. Or you want to add anything to that? No, I, I mean, I think yeah. Russ's point is a great one, especially from the perspective yeah. of wildlife agencies. The same thing, you know, that's, it's a challenge just in wildlife agencies from a state perspective um, sort of have to play the human dimensions game of, you know, what what will work here and what won't work here. And so I think that's where, you know, you could make the argument from leaving it as a state issue. Um, I think you have to sort of factor in the bigger picture and the culture and just the people and residents and situation as well. So I'd sort of echo Russ's comments and also say that, you know, I, I kind of understand why states would be a little hesitant in that regard. Yeah. One other piece to just put in here, obviously, is that our current political dynamic is driving states to become even more possessive. There are States in some parts of the country, for example, that believe that wildlife health matters are best handled at the county level, not even at the state level. Yeah, so yeah. I've never heard that before the last couple of years. So we're going in the wrong direction, I think, on this disease. Well, you know, let me just uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on that question you just raised here, because uh, to me, one of the challenges as a public health practitioner is, is that uh, acceptance is everything in terms of public health practice. And uh, when I look at this issue and I, I you know, hear over and over again that carcass disposal is a great idea until it's not, and then when it's not, it often comes quickly. Uh, the challenge we're going to have here is that people, you know, and Corey, you ran into this in your survey, you know, don't touch this. This is a third rail. But on the other hand, that third rail may light up one day in your, in your backyard and then you have to deal with it. So how should we, from almost a, a psychological perspective, approach carcass disposal 
Uh, will we be better off in the long term if we have a very frank discussion about what is the impact of current carcass disposal? What does it really accomplish? Uh, what happens if we do find one day there's human uh, uh, cases of CWD or other production animals and it actually has an impact on what uh, we're allowed to put into uh, carcass disposal uh, options? You know, what should we do to get ready for the potential for that rather than fear every day that tomorrow could be the day that, uh, you know, we're going to see this change? Yeah, that's a great point, Mike. There are a couple of things here. First off, most of the things that we do for CWD probably should work, but we don't have any data. So we ban baiting because communicable diseases are spread by, by baiting practices, but we don't know that CWD moves that way. We don't know that deer are environmentally affected. We don't know that carcass disposal uh, has an impact. We don't know whether uh, banning uh, certain kinds of lures and attractants for deer has and in fact, you know, we, we are in, in a position where basically all we know about this disease is that reducing densities of deer can suppress prevalence. We know that. Uh, we also know that it's almost impossible to suppress prevalence of deer in most parts of the eastern United States. Mm -hmm. So we're left uh, trying to deal with the disease where we don't really know whether any of the things that we are doing are truly effective. Thank you. Uh, Corey, could you spend just a minute uh, describing to the audience here the work group activity we have ongoing right now uh, around preparing for a potential spillover event and specifically the fact that we have one around carcass disposal, one work group. Uh, can you maybe just share a couple of minutes of what that is all about and uh, kind of a little bit of the, of the co-chairman work uh, that's being done on that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, this was an initiative um was supported by the, the Minnesota State Legislature. Um, they were kind enough to provide uh, funding to basically have SIDREP develop contingency plans um, in regards to CWD. And so what we've basically done, as Mike alluded to, um, was organize sort of the world's experts uh, in sort of five different uh, areas. The first being the human medicine, public health side of things. The second being, uh, you know, servid and uh, non servid production animals, uh, CWD diagnostics or prion diagnostics, uh, carcass and contaminated item disposal. Uh, and then the fifth bucket is the, the wildlife health and conservation side of things. And so, yeah, for each of those groups, we again have pulled uh, two co chairs who I think represent uh, some of the best and brightest as far as those categories go. And then within each of those categories and under those co chairs, we have. Um, you know, between 10 and 15 uh, working group members as well. And we've basically been having these discussions running through scenarios. Um, we've just kicked off, I think we're between our, our first and second meetings here, but basically we're, we're asking these groups, um, you know, what would we, what should we be thinking about? What do we know and not know? And what would happen if we did see, you know, a suspect or confirmed case in a non servant production animal, what would happen if we saw a suspect or confirmed case in a human? Um, and I think the conversations have been really good so far. Uh, I think, you know, in, in terms of this issue, the the cervic carcass disposal side of things, I think that is one of the more sobering points is that, you know, if, if we did see uh, evidence of spillover, I think you would only see this issue of landfills becoming hesitant or no longer accepting carcasses. You would see that you know, grow exponentially overnight. Uh, and I'm not really sure we would have a great alternative um, in that in that situation. So for some of it, it's only just a matter of identifying that we don't have one, a lot of answers and two, a lot of you know good answers at that. So um, it's been been good so far. And I might add that uh, Russ actually co-chairs the Wildlife Conservation Working Group, uh, which is a very important one of the impact that would uh, be felt if, in fact, we do see transmission or if it continues to be a challenge. Russ, do you want to add anything from your role on that? I think uh, the, the one point I might add is that as we develop our CWD plans that we, you know, uh, Corey mentions a lot of states have plans. Um, whether or not those plans are followed is, is is an open question. And we don't have a plan B. If landfills are taken off as an option, what, what exactly is plan B? Uh, 
very frequently we're too reactive in our approach. We haven't proactively sort of gamed out what the next step would be given one alternative or another. So I think that's something that yeah. our wildlife group is quite interested in looking at. Good. Well, we've had a number of really good questions, Martina. We're obviously not going to be able to get to all of them. We'll try to answer them uh, after this. Uh, but let me uh, ask this question because it really goes back to a point that you made, Russ, earlier about why or how do we perceive the risk of uh, CWD to humans and what that means potentially and how people will respond. And the question is, why do you believe so many hunters go to Wisconsin, Minnesota to hunt cervids, especially considering the CWD concerns? I mean, so this is really, uh, hunters are on the front lines and they seem to, at least a number of them, not have concerns about this. How does that translate to the public and what does that mean in terms of uh, programs to reduce uh, carcass uh, contamination on the environment? Well, first off, uh, here's the answer. It turns out Wisconsin is not unique. That's a picture of the three counties in Wisconsin. If I took the CWD counties, and I have, as when I was wildlife chief in the state, looked at the CWD counties in Michigan, you came up with the same pattern. In fact, it was remarkable. When we first got CWD, it was in one or two townships. We traced licenses from those one or two townships. There were 400 people how, uh, that actually came came here from out of state or were going out of state to hunt. So the pattern that you're looking there at, at in Wisconsin is replicated across the country in, in other states. Mm -hmm. um, people do come to the east because deer densities are higher than they are in the west and it's a lot easier and less expensive to get a license. But the patterns are, are you know, every state has traveling hunters. And every state has the same kinds of patterns that you, you looked at on, on Corey's slide. Yeah. So there's one here that uh, I, I want to throw out. I know we don't have much time left. It's from an anonymous attendee, but uh, they say the dangerous prion won't come from deer. It'll come from tissues and exudates of other species like raccoon, skunk, weasel, mouse, et cetera. The first human case of CWD will put the blame on the deer when, in fact, they have gotten it from the plant that took up the pathogenic strain of prion. All the studies by the most brilliant people on earth are hinting at this. Currently, the pathogenic strain may be out there, but in such a minute amount that may be 100 years before a human encounters it. And uh, I'm going to take that one because I think that this is a challenge that we have. And thank you for the point and the question, but I would challenge your point, your facts. I don't think that they're correct. And what's happening is these prions are changing. And we look, for example, at their ability now to look at humanized mice and the ability to actually infect humanized mice with strains that 10 years ago, five years ago, we couldn't do. I think we have to lay all of this out there as a possibility. So I surely wouldn't say that what you laid out couldn't happen, but I think that there is just as high a risk right now. And particularly because as we know, the prion is well positioned in the muscle of, of, of the uh, deer. Uh, and therefore you are in fact, basically eating these prions. And as we know, cooking only concentrates them. So this is even different than BSE, where the prion was primarily in the central spinal column. And so I think we have to keep an open mind. This is not to be scary. This is not to be uh, challenging, but to say right now, I wish I knew exactly what might happen here. And, and I think that surely we could see these other animal species become involved and in potential transmission to a human. But I would not, in a, all of my public health career, say that we can say that whitetail or mule deer or any other cervid that's infected would not serve as a potential source one day. Uh, you know, I, I've been surprised over and over again. I'm, as someone who has been very involved with COVID, I still for the life of me cannot understand how SARS-CoV-2 spread in whitetail deer in this uh, uh, country like it did. It, it, it defies explanation yet what's happening and we're following that carefully. So, you know, I think the, the potential to be surprised is in fact real and our job is to obviously deal with the obvious but also think about what could be a surprise and at least prepare for that should it ever happen and just hope it doesn't so i don't know russ if you or you want to add a context to that uh, I could add you may, one may other, agree or disagree what i'll add two pieces to it first it didn't get to raccoons unless it was in deer first so there is that problem but the other side that i don't think that we should be thinking about is if you look at the um, contact between, uh, for example, deer and livestock in, in Michigan and in other states, it's, and particularly in Michigan, it's perfectly clear 
that uh, the reservoir for bovine tuberculosis is white-tailed deer. We've known it for 30 years. We can't reduce it below one to two percent. And every year, four or five cattle farms show positive. So another possibility, frankly, is a lot more frightening than raccoons or skunks, is the possibility that co-associations of deer and livestock end up with CWD moving back into, into livestock because of its similarities, for example, to BSC or, or scraping for that matter in sheep. And then having people exp uh, exposed in, in that way. So uh, regardless of, of how it comes, as you mentioned, Mike, we do need to be thinking about what we're doing a little bit more carefully, perhaps, and also collecting the data that we need to make sound decisions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Russ. That's really helpful. Corey, you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I think uh, you guys both covered it well. And I, I think, I guess, maybe just back there to one point, I do think, you know, the potential role of an intermediate species is definitely you know not off the table by any means. But as Mike said, I, I don't think, you know, we're at the point where we can discount the possibility of direct transmission from cervids as well. So um, just between the number of CWD infected animals out there and the level of you know exposure that's happening and only presumably increasing each year. I think we have to keep an open mind uh, again, yeah. as Mike said. But um, good, Corey. One other thing before we uh, end it here, uh, the audience would like to get your email address again. Can you just uh, verbally give us that over the air here? Well, I think I can do you one better because I see Leah is ahead of the game. She just put it in the chat. Perfect. Uh, okay. And anyway. Well, we're going to hang up from that. So I just want to repeat for anybody that's interested in Corey's and you want to get the uh, uh, his, his thesis, uh, we're more than happy to help make that happen. So, well, I want to thank both Corey and Russ for this. Uh, this is really very thoughtful. It's, 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 it's cutting edge and it's a little bit scary. And we have to acknowledge that. I wish I knew where carcass disposal was going, what landfill uh, acceptance would be like. Uh, what might happen in the future with uh, potential human or other animal species can, infection. And I think right now, the most important thing we do is keep an open mind. That's, I think, the responsible thing to do, not irresponsible thing to do. We need to keep an open mind to this. We need to understand this. Think where we were 20 years ago. And if someone had said to you, this is where we'd be today, you probably wouldn't have believed it. Nobody would have. And now today, here we are. And so I think we have to anticipate what might the next five, 10 years look like with CWD and prepare for the unexpected and hope that we never have that happen. So thank you everyone for participating today. Uh, again, this will be on our website so you can go back and look at it again. Uh, and I wanna particularly thank Corey and Russ. Uh, what a combination here. Uh, Russ, we, we always so appreciate your support and efforts. Uh, Corey, uh, I think your thesis work was remarkable. I agree with Russ. I'm someone who's done a lot of national work. 50 state survey completion is pretty remarkable. <laughs> and uh, we acknowledge that and thank you very, very much. So everyone have a good day. Have a good, ho happy holidays, a safe, happy holidays. And uh, thank you all. Bye.